from the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering Comcast Innovation Day. Brought to you by Comcast. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at the Comcast Silicon Valley Innovation Center here in Sunnyvale, California. They had a really cool thing today. It was the Customer Experience Day, brought a bunch of Comcast executives and a bunch of thought leaders in the customer experience space. We're excited to come down and, and, uh, and sit in and talk to some of the guests and really excited about our next guest because he's an anthropologist. He's Brian Solis, digital analyst, author, analyst, anthropologist, futurist. Brian, you got it all going on. Thanks for taking a few minutes of your day. <laughs> of course, and this is a really great conversation, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So first off, just kind of impressions of, of, of the conversation earlier today, talking about customer experience. The, you know, the, the, the expectation, you know, consumerization of IT is something we talk a lot about, where you know, people's expectations of the way this stuff is supposed to work change all the time, and what was, was magical and almost impossible, like talking on a cell phone in your car, you know, suddenly becomes <laughs> expect expected in the norm. So how do you think of this as, as you look at kind of these big sweeping changes that we're going through? Well, today's conversation I think has been sort of a spotlight on what's most important, which is innovation not for the sake of innovation, but innovation for the sake of pushing the customer experience forward changing customer behaviors in a way that's going to create a new standard for experiences. And that way you become the leader in engagement. Everybody else has to catch up to you. And I th what was so important is that, you know, we're here at a company with all the love that you know, wasn't the best in customer experience several years ago. And now they're sort of one of the pioneers in what customer experience needs to be from a technological standpoint, a customer service standpoint, and an overall experience standpoint. Right. I want to jump into the voice capability specifically because I don't, I don't think there's really a enough um, accolades as to what Comcast has achieved with the voice remote. I think if you don't have it, you don't know it's there. And you know, the, the ability to, to migrate across hundreds or thousands of channels, multiple services to find the show that you want with just the, the, the ask of your voice is, is amazing. What's even more amazing is trying to teach people to actually navigate that way. So <laughs> changing people's behavior in the way they interact with devices is not a simple thing. So, it's come up and it's, it's, all, it's an expression shared in, in many UI and UX circles, which is the best interface is no interface. And in many ways, voice was the next frontier. That's a frontier that was pioneered, I think at a mass level by Amazon and Alexa, Apple and Siri, uh, Google and OK Google. We're really starting to see that voice as a, a UI is much more natural. What makes it so complex is all of the back end. I think Comcast has done a really nice job in the simplistic linguistic engagement of uh, say in the name of a TV show or a, a genre of shows or movies, and then the back end to be reimagined in order to bring you something that's not just this long list of stuff that is much more intuitive and helps you get to what they call time to joy much faster. That's game changing, right? But that isn't just something that Comcast looked, for example, to just Alexa or uh, anything specifically. It looked, and also especially not to other cable companies. Right, right. They look to the best in class experiences in every area to pick those parts and build something altogether new that becomes a new standard. And I think voice, you know, one of the things that you and I were talking about, Jeff, earlier was kids, right? There was a time where they would walk up to a screen and they still do to some regard, you know, where they want to do this. But I have a three-year-old at home who has a toy remote control and I, I, I had to record video, you know, from afar of just watching her talk into her toy remote, <laughs> Mickey Mouse Club, Mickey Mouse Club. And just sitting there with all the patience in the world, nothing was happening, but expecting right. that something was going to happen. And it's just a new standard. The other thing, though, is that we're not we're not done, right? We 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 now live in an era of AI, machine learning, automation. So personalization now is really going to start to build upon voice experiences, where it's just simply turning on the TV is going to give you instant options of all of the things you're most likely going to want to watch all on one nav. Right. It's just we say that, and yet we still have QWERTY keyboards, right? We're, which were specifically designed to slow people down, and yet now we're not using ARM typewriters anymore, and we still have QWERTY keyboards. So changing people's behavior is is not easy, and it's interesting to see kind of these generational shifts based on the devices in which they grew up using kind of define the way in which they expect everything else to work. But it's, you know, I still get the email, maybe, or even they talked about here at Comcast, where instead of just saying, um, NC2A football, it knows I like to watch Stanford football. It's, it suggests, you know, maybe you should just say Stanford football. So there's still kind of a lot of education, surprising amount of education that has to happen. Yes and no. I, if you think about 
the conversation, I, I often talk about it in terms of iteration and innovation. Iteration is doing the same things better. Innovation is creating new value. And if you look at the evolution of the remote control, I mean, just go back 50 years, it has gotten progressively worse over time. In fact, on average, today's remote control has 70 buttons on it, right? And if you think about iteration in that regard, we've completely started to fail in the user interface. I don't know that anybody has mastered their relationship with the remote control except for some geeks. So I think if anything, voice is going to change the game for the better. Yeah, I was in the business for a long time, and now we know what killed the VCR, right? It was the flashing 12. Nobody could ever get the flashing 12. And for all young people, look it up on the internet. You'll figure out what, what, what a VCR and a flashing 12 is. So you talk about a, something called Generation C. What is Generation C? Why should we be paying attention? Oh, look, I think voice is a good example of Generation C. So anybody who uses, you mentioned QWERTY, right? I, I don't know that I've actually even used QWERTY in a sentence in a really long time, but I'm old enough to, I, I trained on a manual typewriter back in the day. So uh, it doesn't mean that I don't get it. It means that my behaviors and my expectations as a human being have changed because of my relationship, my personal relationship. You know, so for example, in consumerization of technology and IT, my personal relationship is, changed with technology and so what i had found in my research over the years was especially when it comes to customer experience if you study a customer journey and you look at demographics of these personas that we've created you can see specifically that people who live a mobile first lifestyle regardless of age will make decisions the same way they're increasingly impatient they're demanding they're self-centered uh, i call them accidental narcissists they 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 want time convenience are really important uh, they want personalization their standards are much different than the personas that we've developed in the past and so i gave it a name which was generation c because it wasn't one or c stood for connected it wasn't one bound by age or traditional demographics, education, income. It was defined by shared interests, behaviors, and shared outcomes. And it was a game changer for all things. If you're going to point innovation or customer experience or whatever it is, and you're going to aim at that growing customer segment, then they're going to have a different set of needs than your traditional customer. Right. But it's, it's just so bizarre, again, how quickly the novel becomes expected baseline and how you know the great search uh, algorithm that we get out of Google, which is based on lots and lots and lots and lots of data and a bunch of smart people and a whole bunch of hardware and software, suddenly now we expect that same search result if we're searching on, I don't know, some pick some random retailer or some other random website when, when in fact that is special, but we have this just crazy sliding scale of what's expected and how, how can companies you know, kind of stay out in front of that at least at least chase close behind because it's a very different it's a very different world in how fast the expectations change. I'm sorry, I totally spaced out because my attention span went away. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That, but that, that, <laughs> well, I didn't get to the attention economy <laughs> question yet. <laughs> it's uh, you're competing at a much different level today, and I think that's what's so disruptive for companies is that they're still thinking that momentum and progress and experience and performance and success. I always say that success is the worst teacher when it comes to innovation because you're based, you're basing your decisions on the future based on things that what you did on the in the past. So what do companies need to get is that the customers change. I'll give you an example. I think in many ways. Uh, Companies compete against Uber, right? Uh, because Uber has changed the game for what it takes to get a service brought to you and to give it to you and take you to where you need to go, where time and convenience are big factors of that. So for example, one of the things I studied was uh, how long is too long to wait for an Uber before you open Lyft in certain markets? <laughs> and the reason that I wanted to do that was I wanted to show that the number went down every single year. Uh, now, for example, Uber will advertise in, in, in Sydney that the average pickup time is three minutes and 39 seconds because it knows that it's a competitive advantage over, over everybody else because it's important. Because once that, once that experience happens to you and you get something your way fast, you're not going to suddenly realize when you're at the Department of Motor Vehicles that, well, I understand that this isn't Uber and therefore I shouldn't expect to have things done in a much more efficient, personal manner. You take that mindset subconsciously to everything you do. So while it's a threat, it's also an opportunity, but you gotta break that executive mindset to say, how can we take best in class experiences across the board and how can we apply it to what we do? Yeah. Now you had an interesting con uh, concept in, in the conversation earlier today where you know there was a question about ROI and you, you threw it back as ROE, return on experience. <laughs> so how, you know, how should, 
should people start to adjust their thinking? Because the thing on, you know, return on investment implies almost a very small, you know, kind of direct impact, kind of one-to-one -one, uh, benefit, where really return on experience implies a much broader, you know, kind of accidental benefits, benefits across a lot of parameters that you may or may not necessarily be measuring. Right. It's a very, a much better way to, you know, measure your investment. Look, it's it's almost impossible to get away from the ROI conversation. It's important. Look, executives uh, have to make decisions based on what they know the outcomes are going to be. A lot of this is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so if you can tie some types of rudimentary metrics that are going to show progress and also return, it helps. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I always say, what, what happens in the ROI equation if I equals ignorance? What's the return of ignorance? What's the return of not doing something? Right. And so what I tried to demonstrate in a book I wrote about experience design, which was called X, uh, it was, let's break it down to what we're actually trying to do. The word experience actually means an emotional reaction to a moment. And so, for example, in a high sales pitch situation, like a dealership for an autom automobile, that's not a good experience. If you have to call customer service, you've probably not had a good experience. And all of those things are emotional. So if you can design for emotional outcomes where people are going to feel great in the moment and feel great afterwards, that is a metric that you can have a before and after state. The likelihood of attaching that emotion to things like loyalty, customer lifetime value, growth, then you can get to your ROI in a different way, but you have to first do it with intention. Yeah, Brian, fascinating conversation. We could go all day, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're going to have to leave it there. But thanks for uh, for joining today, and thanks for spending a few minutes oh, with thank us. Thank you. Thank you. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Absolutely. He's Brian. I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cube. We're at the Comcast Innovation Center in Sunnyvale. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Oh.